right, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Voyage Church. For those that are still making their way in, for those of you watching via live stream, we thank you guys for joining us uh, today. Uh, my name is Ben Fleet. I'm one of our pastors. And so, uh, again, it's so good to have each and every one of you uh, joining us, whether you're here on our public campus or privately from wherever you're watching. Thank you guys for joining us today. Again, if you're a first-time guest, uh, make sure you fill out a visitor's card uh, so we can get a record of your attendance and we can track you down and uh, stalk you. Yeah. Uh, we'd love to do that for Please. all of our new people. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But we do want to say thank you for joining us. We have a small gift for you uh, to take on your way out today. Uh, this morning, we are continuing our sermon series called Triumph and the Cross as we are finishing uh, the Gospel of Mark. And as we do so today, we're going to be looking at Jesus' uh, suffering uh, leading up to the cross. And as we do so, I really wanted to draw our hearts into this passage from Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, our scripture says, Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us and the opportunity we have uh, to meet together, whether that's here publicly in our, in our campus, Lord, or privately in homes. God, I just pray and ask that in our time together to get today, you will be glorified. But God, in our time of worship, as we meditate on the lyrics of the song, God, you will continue to draw our hearts to you and to the goodness of the gospel. And Lord, as we look at your word today, that it will speak to our hearts, and uh, that God, you will continue to change us more into the image of Jesus himself. And God, we ask all of this in his name. Amen. Good morning, church. It's good to be gathered together in our church space again. Uh, it's good to see everybody this morning as well. So I just want to, before we jump into worship, point out our little song sheets again that are available at both campuses this morning. Um, so we're doing this because we can't all sing along and stand together like we used to. So um, we just wanted to provide the words in a little bit of a different way so that everyone can meditate on the words of these worship songs more, which a lot of the times are straight scripture. So I just wanted to point this out to us this morning. And again, the bolded words, the bolded sections are going to be the parts that are repeated throughout the whole song. All right, let's worship together. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. You conquered the grave. You free, free captive, and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. Thank you. 
faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For the promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. You conquer the grave, you free every captive and break every chain. Oh, I've done great things. We dance in your greed, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, I've done great
Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time where we can just praise your name through every circumstance, God, through every high and every low, God. We know that you stand firm, that you are unshaken. Hallelujah, God. You're just worthy of it all. I pray that you receive all the honor and glory from our lips, from our hearts this morning, God. I pray that you would be with the words that are about to be said and spoken from your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you, Morgan and Dakota, for leading us in worship this morning. Um, I'm glad you guys have beautiful voices, because I don't. Um, and wearing a mask, you have to smell your breath, which is even worse, for some of us anyway, especially if you already had coffee. But I didn't have coffee, so I don't know what my excuse is. I'm kind of just stretching to make sure everything's fine to go on the live stream, so sorry for the <laughs> random chat anyway uh again thank you guys for joining us we are in mark 15 today uh, we have got three weeks left of our sermon series triumph in the cross and uh today uh we are uh in mark 15 preaching verses 1 through 20 and the title of today's sermon if you're into titles is uh called the scapegoat um and making sure i have all my pages here uh and so anyway if you know anything of what a scapegoat is, it's a phrase that most of us are used to in some way, shape, or form. We've probably heard that phrase used. Maybe you've been the scapegoat of a situation before or whatever. But uh, the dictionary defines a scapegoat as a person who is blamed for the wrongdoings, mistakes, or faults of others, especially for reasons of expediency. Now, we've all been there, haven't we, where there's been a moment of scapegoating Maybe it was that fight with one of your younger siblings and you threw the last punch, but you got punished for the whole thing, right? Or maybe it was in um, your school classroom and the whole classroom is acting up, uh, but you are the one that gets punished for it. You know, I've been there before. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, or, you know, maybe it's at work when uh, the, the situation, that sounds like fun, uh, or maybe it was at work when the whole company's performing poorly, but you or someone you know is punished for it. Whatever it is, we're all familiar with the idea of a scapegoat. The original term comes from Leviticus 16. When on the Day of Atonement, uh, what would happen is they would bring a goat into the temple and they would, uh, the, the priest would lay their hands on this goat. And it was kind of like identifying that this goat is taking uh, the sins, the curse of sin for all of the nation. And they would then take that goat into the wild and release it. And they would tie a, uh, hey, Dakota, you want to give me, slide me over one slide? Uh, one more. I'm sorry. But uh, here's a picture. And they would tie this red string onto his horns. And uh, so it's kind of symbolic that like if you're out in the wilderness one day, you see this goat, you don't touch that goat. OK, because that goat has been cursed. It is carrying the curse of the nation of Israel's sins. And this is where the idea of the scapegoat or term scapegoat originally came from. But along with that, we've all seen scapegoats in our life, one shape or form. Next picture, Dakota. Um, nothing rings more true than this guy. Okay. Anybody know who this guy is? The guy who brought the goat? No. <laughs> this is Steve Bartman. Okay. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Steve Bartman and the curse he had to bear. Steve Bartman was a diehard Chicago Cubs fan. Now that's where he went wrong to begin with. Okay. But he was a diehard Chicago Cubs fan. And in 2003, the Chicago Cubs were playing in the National League Championship Series. So they are, it's a seven game series. First team that wins four games wins the series, as you can tell. And the Cubs are up three games to two against the Florida Marlins in game six. They're up three to nothing in the top of the eighth inning. So they are four outs away from 
clinching a spot in the World Series. The Cubs hadn't been to a World Series since 1945. They hadn't won the World Series since 1908. So it had been 95 years of pent up frustration and anger in Chicago. And they're four outs away from getting back to the World Series. So at the top of the eighth, with two outs, the Cubs are up three to nothing, and a foul ball is hit. And if you've ever seen baseball, you're aware of how it works. There's like fair territory, which is all the field, right? And then there's foul territory, which kind of goes into the stands. And the stands are right there. And Steve Bartman, as you can tell, is sitting on the edge of the stands. And he does what every fan would do in a foul ball situation. He goes to catch the foul ball. Well, what he doesn't realize is that Moises Alou, one of the Cubs outfielders, is standing right there and can easily reach up and catch this ball. And if he catches it, it's an out and the inning is over. Well, Steve Bartman doesn't see Moises Alou because his eyes on the ball and he goes for the play and he interferes with Moises Alou catching the ball. Well, Moises Alou is ticked. Like, why did you do this? And he just does what every fan would do in this situation. Well, as the inning would go on, the Marlins would go on to score eight runs with two outs. They scored eight runs in this inning. And, you know, you can imagine like Steve Bartman, like, oh, that was a bonehead move. Why did I do that? But it's two outs. What's the big deal? Then the guy gets on base. Then there's like a home run. Then it's three to two. And it's like, uh oh. Then it's eight to three. And as the whole inning devolves into chaos, all of everyone's frustration is poured out onto this fan by the name of Steve Bartman. It gets so bad that security comes in and they said, hey, listen, we need you to leave. And we need you to leave now. The inning's not even over, and they have to take him, escort him out of the stadium. People are following him out of the stadium. He gets to work the next day. He has got threats on his life. People are calling his house, threatening to kill him. The Marlins go on to win the series, and everyone blames Steve Bartman. Now, was it Steve Bartman's fault that the Cubs gave up a three-run lead in the top of the eighth inning? With two outs? No, it's not Steve Bartman's fault, but all of Chicago poured all of their anger and vitriol out on Steve Bartman. Now, perhaps we've never experienced anything like that, right? Maybe it wasn't that bad, but we've all seen scapegoating in one way, shape, or form. But as bad as Steve Bartman's story is, and maybe we could go around the room or maybe if you're at Cody and Sonia's or you're at your house, you could sit there and tell some pretty bad stories about scapegoating. As bad as those stories are, what if I was to tell you that God could one up all of our stories? That he's like, hey, you want to talk about scapegoating? Let me tell you a story. As a matter of fact, that's the story we're looking at today here in Mark chapter 15. In Mark 15 today, what we're about to see is that the, the depravity and collective guilt of all of humanity. And when I say all of humanity, what I'm talking about in, in, in scriptural context, there's like basically one racial division given in scripture, Jews and Gentiles. And what we're going to see in our text today is that the depravity and collective guilt of not just the Jews, not just the Gentiles, but everybody combined is about to be poured out upon Jesus. As a matter of fact, though, this is of no surprise to Jesus. It's not like he is um, caught off guard by any of this. If we were to go weeks back when we were in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus details descriptions of how he is going to be persecuted and how he's going to have to suffer even leading up to his crucifixion. Jesus knew full well what was about to happen. And similar to how the Bartman incident devolved into pure chaos one night in Chicago, so Jesus is about to endure terrible suffering as the scapegoat for humanity's sin. 
So what we're going to see here in our text today is basically three events really take place in these verses. We see that the Jewish Sanhedrin first fabricate charges to, against Jesus. Then Pilate pulls this whole complete unjust move where he frees a guilty man and condemns an innocent man. And then the Roman soldiers torture and humiliate Jesus. So let's look at our text together. We're going to begin looking at the first five verses of our text. And the scripture tells us in Mark 15, verses 1 through 5, I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It says, As soon as it was morning, having held a meeting with the elders, scribes, and the whole Sanhedrin, the chief priests tied Jesus up, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You say so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate questioned him again, Aren't you going to answer? Look how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus still did not answer. And so Pilate was amazed. Now, we talk, kind of talked about this last week, if you listen to Cody's sermon, but uh, or you watched Cody's sermon if you were there with Cody and then wherever you were. Uh, but really, we see this trial, this mock trial, this kangaroo court take place this the night before, where Jesus is brought in, and I think it was the old, I think it was in the Soviet Union, they used to say, you know, show me the man and I'll show you the crime that's been committed. That's kind of what they do with Jesus. They bring him in, they have all these witnesses who try to make up these charges that none of them really stick. And then finally, they just ask Jesus point blank, are you the son of the blessed one? Are you the son of God? And Jesus can't lie. And so he's like, yes, I am. So at that point, they charge him with heresy. And so now early the next morning, we see that they, they can't technically hold a trial at night. It was against Jewish uh, law to do this. So they have to wait till the morning. Along with this, they probably were waiting for more people to trickle in to make sure they got enough votes to condemn him. And so then they, in the morning, as soon as the sun comes up, they condemn him guilty of heresy. So they take him to Pilate. And Pilate is kind of the prefect of Rome for the area. He's in Jerusalem for Passover. It's like the busiest time of year. So, of course, he's in Jerusalem at this time. So they bring him to Pilate. But they don't tell Pilate what he's guilty of. They don't tell Pilate he's, uh, he's charged with heresy. Because Pilate doesn't care. Pilate is not Jewish. He doesn't care if Jesus is a heretic or not. But so they said they have to try to come up with something that they can get him killed for. Okay. So again, like calling him a heretic, Pilate's like, hey, I don't care, but I'm not killing somebody for heresy. And the Sanhedrin didn't have authority to kill anyone anymore. They had used to. And then the Roman government was like, you know what? We're going to take that power back because we don't really trust you guys with that. And so they're trying to figure out how on earth can we get Pilate to kill this guy. So instead they said, well, you know what? Here's a title that'll stick. He's calling himself the king of the Jews. So they charge him with blasphemy in their courtroom. But now they change their wording a little bit to try to make it more political, to make it more of a threat to the Roman Empire. And as a matter of fact, this is the first time in the entire Gospel of Mark that the term king of the Jews is used. Mark is using this in, in his literature for a very important purpose. And he's going to use this phrase, king of the Jews, five times in this chapter. And the idea is to show us is that while um, the rest of humanity is about to use the cross to humiliate Jesus, God in turn is using the cross to elevate him. And so in this moment, he is showing that, yes, he is the king. He is the Messiah. And it is at this point when people begin to realize truly who Jesus is. So the Jewish Sanhedrin began by fabricating treasonous charges against Jesus. And then we see now, we see Pilate uses this to unjustly free a guilty man and then condemn an innocent man. Look with me, if you will, at verse 6. It says, At the festival, 
Pilate used to release the, for the people a prisoner whom they requested. Now, for starters, this does not sound just at all. You know, like either he's got people in prison for a bogus reason or this is just an unjust move. I mean, can you imagine? He's like, well, it's Christmas, so I'm going to release to you a prisoner. Who do you want? Let's take a vote. It's like a popularity contest. You know, like I think it would be good reality TV. Um, but what did you say? Jerusalem's most wanted okay so then he, so it goes on it says there was one man named barabbas who was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the rebellion his full name is actually jesus barabbas if you actually do some study about this character so we've got two jesuses here we've got a criminal and we've got well, God in the flesh, right? And so here's Barabbas, and this guy, he's not a good guy at all. As a matter of fact, he is known for uh, uh, trying, he was a thief, and in the process of trying to steal something from someone, he kills someone in the process, he and two of his buddies, and they're in jail, and they're about to be crucified. But then there is this glimmer of hope for Barabbas, because Passover's coming up. And I'm an insurrectionist that hates Rome. And so there's a lot of, of anger between the Jewish people and the Roman government. So I might have a chance here of getting out, you know, because like I'm kind of this Jewish patriot. And so like as a matter of fact, it could have been that there was already a crowd forming to try to get Barabbas freed. So it didn't really matter who's going up against Barabbas. They're in trouble, you know. But then on top of that, the scripture tells us that the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them, as was his custom. And Pilate answered them, well, do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? For he knew it was because of envy that the chief priest had handed him over. I just think that's interesting. He's like, he knows full well what they're doing. Like this is just made up charges. And verse 11 says, But the chief priest that stirred up the crowd so that he would release Barabbas to them instead. And Pilate asked them again, Then what do you want me to do with the one you call the king of the Jews? Again, they shouted, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him. And wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. And after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. We see Pilate unjustly frees a man who is guilty of murder and theft, and he condemns an innocent man to death. Barabbas is set and destined for the cross. The cross was the most uh, severe way of torture that the Roman government had. And it was saved for the worst of the worst. As a matter of fact, if you are a Roman citizen, you weren't even allowed legally to be crucified. It's only if you were not a citizen. And so here, and they saved this device, this way of death, for their worst criminals as an example to the rest of the world. That when you mess with Rome, this is what we do to you. And the cross, it was this extreme form of torture. As, as hard as it sounds, being nailed to the cross and all of that, the hardest part was the struggle. And most people died from suffocating to death because eventually the whole process was designed to where you'd have to pull yourself up to catch a breath, and then you'd come down. And so you just keep doing this, and you keep doing this until your muscles give out and you suffocate. Or if the Roman government got tired of watching, they just broke your legs. So then you just suffocated real fast. Sounds fun, right? Um, and this is what Barabbas deserves for his crimes. But instead, they say, no, free Barabbas and put Jesus on the cross. Pilate sees this as a political victory. Proverbs 17, 15 tells us that acquitting the guilty and condemning the just, both are detestable to the Lord. But yet, Pilate doesn't care. And as a matter of fact, as we walk through the narrative, each person that is brought to the decision of what will you do with Jesus, chooses to save their own skin. 
Peter, last week, denies him. Why? To save himself. The Sanhedrin, as well, chooses to do this. And Caiaphas had said, if you go read the Gospel of John, it would be better that one man die than all of us die for there being an insurrection. So the Sanhedrin themselves trumped these charges against Jesus. Why? To save their own skin. Pilate, the leader over Jerusalem and over Judea, chooses again to crucify Jesus. Why? Because he doesn't want an insurrection on his hands. And so instead he says, you know what? I want to satisfy the crowd. Verse 15 says this. Pilate chooses to please the crowd rather than choosing to do the right thing. And so he hands Jesus over to be tortured and humiliated. Scriptures tell us in verse 15, it says, after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. And I, I think it's amazing that like this is all Mark has to say about Jesus' flogging. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails. If you understand anything about this, this is not like, like to me, it's like, oh, he was beaten. No, he wasn't just beaten. He was tortured uh, to begin with. If you know anything about it, it was a, uh, the cat of nine tails was a whip. It had nine leather straps attached to it. And in those leather straps were fragments of glass and bone. So it was designed that as you whip the person, it would dig into the skin and just tear it out. And, and there were often many cases where people died during the flogging. They didn't even make it to crucifixion. But Jesus does. And so this is where the story begins. He begins by being flogged. And then the scriptures tell us that he's handed over to be crucified. It says that the soldiers lead him away into the palace. That is the governor's residence. And it says that they call the whole company together. Now, this is not just a handful of guys at this point. At this point, 600 to 1,000 Roman soldiers gather around to humiliate and mock the God in the flesh. They bring him there, and it says they put a purple robe on him. More likely what it was is this was one of the Roman centurion's like red capes, but they put it on him, which after having been beaten, it just like sticks to his body, as you can imagine. And so then they create, oh, it's this king of the Jews. And they play this game called king for a day. Now, most of these soldiers are not Jewish men. Most of them actually come from the surrounding countryside, including Samaria, which if you know anything about Samaria, Jews hated Samaritans and Samaritans vice versa. There was this racial tension between the two. And so here's this guy who's been charged with being called the king of the Jews. And you can imagine the anger and the hatred that is about to be poured out on him and the racism for who he is. So they bring him in and they decide they're going to honor this king. So they give him a robe and then they fashion a, a crown made of thorns and they put it on his head and they give him a staff as this king and they all gather around and they begin mocking this king and bowing down to this king of the Jews and then they take his staff and they just begin beating him with it. They begin spitting on him. Hundreds of men at this point, just laughing at God in the flesh and pouring out their racism, sadism, anger, and hatred out on him. I can just imagine, like, here's Jesus with this crown of thorns, and they just take the staff and begin beating him over the head with it digging the, the crown even deeper into his skin. And then the mockery, ha screaming, Hail, King of the Jews. How did we get to this point? How did we get here? The soldiers leading him away. Look at verse 17. They dress him in a purple robe, twisting a crown of thorns, and they put it on him. They begin to salute him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they're spitting, they're hitting him on the head with a stick and spitting on him, getting down on their knees and paying him homage. And it says, after they mocked him, they then stripped him of the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. How did we get to this point? 
How did we get from like just a few days ago, Jesus entering the city of Jerusalem with palm branches being waved, people throwing their coats on the ground, to now an angry Roman horde pouring out all their racism and hatred and vitriol against the Jews on Jesus himself. Well, as a matter of fact, Peter tells us and gives us a good answer over in Acts chapter 4. If you want to look there, you can in Acts chapter 4. If not, it'll be on the screen. But Peter is praying, and by the way, this is very intentional, Mark's description. Mark's description of these events here in Mark 15, he is trying to show us that Jewish people are responsible for the death of Jesus and Gentiles are responsible for the death of Jesus as well. It's not just one race of people or another. It's all of us combined. And it, given the situation, we probably all would have done the same thing to save our own skin. Acts chapter 4 verses 27 and 28, Peter is praying after being released from prison. And he says these words, he says, For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. As evil as these events are, what we begin to see in this passage is that in God's sovereignty, he allows the world to come and lay their hands on Jesus. And Jesus willingly bears the brunt of humanity's shame and humanity's sin. Jesus takes the penalty of our sin. Jesus is our scapegoat. So as we begin to kind of conclude our study today, I want to ask this: ask you this question. Who is being held accountable for your sins? If you were to stand before God right now, who would be held accountable for your actions? The worst decisions, the, the, the most terrible things you've ever done, who's being held accountable for those? Is it you? If it's you, then like it doesn't have to be. As we see this passage, Jesus is taking the brunt of the worst of humanity upon himself. He is about to die a substitutionary death on the cross, but that's not where the story ends. If it did, then he just, another person died. But Jesus resurrects from the dead. He comes back to life. He defeats sin and sin's penalty death. And as a, as a result, if we will put our faith and trust and repent of our sins, then we can have eternal life with him. We're given new life. We're restored into a new relationship with God. And so if, if you today have sit, are sitting here and you're saying, I have never made that decision, but I'm ready then that's our challenge, to repent and believe. We encourage you, talk to one of us here. We would love to share with you how we made that decision and how you can make that decision as well. Maybe you're here or maybe you're watching but you say, and you say, hey, listen, that sounds really good, but I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. That's okay. We don't want to like try to force you or coerce you into making a, de a decision because if I can force or coerce you into that, we could probably force you out of it as well. What we want to do is help you begin sorting through any questions or objections to the gospel that you might have. And so here's my challenge. If you say, I'm listening, I'm interested, but I'm not ready for that. I want you to think through what's holding you back. And my challenge to you this week is to talk to a believer you know about that. Talk to them about that objection, that question, whatever you have. That's my challenge to you. Then if you're here and you're listening or you're watching and you would say, hey, Jesus is being held, was held accountable for my sin. Jesus took the penalty for my sin. Then here's my challenge to you today. Quit hiding your sin. We don't have to try to cover up the mistakes we make. No, we get the, the privilege to confess them and expose sin for what it is and instead allow others around us to walk with us in that struggle. 
You don't have to fight this battle alone. And Christ doesn't want you to. Christ did not pay the penalty for your sins, so you would then penalize yourself by trying to hide it. Instead, confess it and walk with others to get through it. If you're here and you've put your faith in Jesus, quit hiding your story. Look at everything Jesus is going through. The humiliation and the shame he took for you and for your sin. If Jesus has freed you from the shame and guilt that comes with sin, and he's given you a new hope, don't you think that there are others that need that hope as well? Don't hide your story. Tell people, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a co-worker, maybe it's a friend, and they need to hear the hope of the gospel. Quit hiding your story. Instead, share it with them. And finally, quit hiding your praise. Jesus took the curse. He bore the worst the world has to offer. And he deserves all of our thanks and our praise for it. In 2016, the Cubs won the World Series. And when they were giving out World Series rings, one fan got a ring. You know who it was? It was Steve Bartman, the man who bore the worst that Chicago had to offer, was elevated to the highest fan they could ever give. And Jesus, the same way, was had to suffer through the worst that humanity had to offer. But today, he is not a defeated king. Jesus is elevated to the status of king over not just Israel, but all of the human race. And for those who repent and believe in him, we are granted an eternal life of freedom. Now let's use that freedom to praise him and glorify his name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us. God, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. But God, we thank you that Jesus came and paid the penalty for us. That God, as we look at our narrative today, the racial hatred that is poured out upon Jesus, God, he took the worst the world had to offer so we could have the best that you could give. God, I pray that if there is someone watching or here or with Cody and Sonia, that God that's never put their faith and trust in Jesus, that God, they would repent of their sins and believe on Him today. And God, for those of us who have already experienced the freedom that comes with salvation, that God, you would help us not to be ashamed to be afraid, but instead to be empowered by the gospel. To live lives that say, hey, we're not perfect. We are broken sinners, but we are being made new and we're being made like Christ. God, I pray that you would give us lives of empowerment to proclaim the gospel to our friends and our loved ones and to praise you for who you are and all you deserve. God, we ask this all in the mighty name of Jesus. song that we're going to sing together this morning is called King of Kings. Thought, um, how appropriate, according to our scripture that we just studied and heard about. Um, and the chorus says, praise the Father and praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of Kings. Just encourage you to worship your own way this morning, just maybe in your heart, um, maybe stand, dance around, sing it out loud, um, 
just heard me want to praise him and just publicly proclaim that this morning, that praise and worship that Pastor Ben just challenged us with. Um, if Jesus has freed you, then don't hide that, you know. Let's praise him together.
so just a few closing announcements uh, before we head out today. Thank you guys again for joining us. For those of you on our live stream as well, we really appreciate everyone tuning in, and uh, whether you're in person or online. Um, just a few uh, announcements. I already said that. I don't know why I said it again. If you're interested in giving to Voyage Church, uh, there's two ways you can do it. You can do it at our website, voyagechurchmtl.com. There's a gift tab you can go to there, or you can give on our at our donation box right here in house. Um, and so, your gifts are always appreciated. They keep the lights on, as we always say. Uh, along with that, uh, after our service today, we are going over to have a picnic. It is not supposed to rain this afternoon, so we're going to try to have a picnic. That is on Street. What? Bu Buchan, whatever it's called. It's like two blocks over. Yeah. So it's not far. It's right across the street from Morgan and Dakota's house. There's a little picnic or park, grassy knoll. There's a grassy knoll there. <laughs> but not the same one from the JFK assassination. Oh. So don't, not to be confused. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really nice. It's new. Um, so we're going to do the Lord's Supper there, and uh, then we'll eat together. So we'd love to have you guys uh, join us along with that. Uh, so Wednesday night, we have Bible study. That is at Ben and Alyssa Fleet's house. If you are interested, it, that is also a block away uh, over on Rupare. Um, and we'd love to give you more details about that. We're going through the book of 1 Corinthians right now. And uh, last week was our first week. We eat together, we read the Bible together, and we just hang out and have a good time. So we'd love to have you there. That's Wednesday night. What time is it? Six. Six, 6 p.m. So if you want more details, ask Alyssa. She can tell you. Um, it's at her house. Um, also, it's a joke because it's also at my house. I just don't remember. Um, Friday mornings, we do volunteering. Uh, we do volunteer at a food kitchen um, that's called Multicaf. I must have shared the warmth for some reason. I'm like, no, that's Renaissance. So it's not us. Um, Renaissance is our, our mother church, if you want to call it that. Anyway, so it's at Multicaf, and if you'd be interested in learning more about that, uh, a handful of ladies go over there on Friday mornings to volunteer, and of course, they, they always appreciate more hands. So if you want to do that, we'd love to have you there. Coming up, September 6th, is our one-year anniversary of our church launch. And so that Sunday, we will not be meeting in-house. We're going to have a big like outdoor gathering and we'll worship together there and we're going to eat together and just have a good time and celebrate together. All that the Lord's done this past year. And so if you'd be interested, uh, follow our Facebook and Instagram pages and there'll be more details about uh, where that's going to be and so on and so forth. Um, is there anything else that I'm forgetting? I feel like I'm forgetting something. Okay. What? Oh, questions? Well, I didn't even talk about it. Um, There's one question. Oh, good. There's a question. Great. Uh, uh, yeah. So something we try to do every week is our Q&A. And so part of that is if you have a question regarding today's teaching, you can text our text-free number at 438-899-0858. And uh, we talk through those. Um, so today's, here's one, of, one question for today. And if you have one, you can still send it in to that number, 438-899-0858. The question is, should we walk with others and confess our sins? Does that mean we should always be confessing our sins to other people? Well, that's a good question, whoever sent that. Um, I know who it was, but anyway. Uh, that's a really good question. So I'm gonna, I'll repeat it again. It says, if we should walk with others and confess sins, does that mean we should always be confessing our sins to other people? And I would say, yes. I think confession of sin is healthy. I think the scriptures tell us in the book of James to confess our sins to one another. Um, now, I will say, uh, regarding the certain types of sin, it might be, Obviously, be uh, cautious and be careful who you confess that to. Um, I have friends that confess them to me. 
and it's very personal, it's very like private when they share it because you know it doesn't need to be said in front of a whole group of people, you know? And so I would say too that, that absolutely like confess our sins to one another, um, especially if it's something that um, is really hindering our Christian growth and our Christian walk. And if it's something like that, then which I would say all sin does. So yes, I would say all sin needs to be confessed. Now I will say with that, does that mean that we need to confess every sin we ever commit 24-7? Well no, because if that was the case, my discipleship group would be filled with two hours of me confessing sin, you know? Um, so I would just say with that, that like obviously you want to confess the sin that you're struggling with, but also like you can confess your sin to God as well. Um, I would say the purpose of confessing sin is being held accountable for those actions. And so like if it's something you feel like you need to be held accountable for, then confess it to someone else. If it's just something like, you know, something you said out of anger or whatever, then you might want to confess it to God and God alone. Um, and so I would say if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit, so use the Holy Spirit and His discretion um, to guide you into that. And if you ever have a question about confession of sin, feel free to ask people about it. Um, so that was good. Are there any other questions? I don't know if I even answered that question very well, but um, I don't think there's any other questions. So with that said, uh, you are sent out, so let's go and make disciples this week. God bless, and you are dismissed.